welcome to part three of our video on Enbridge. So this is the the last video uh, in the Enbridge trilogy, yeah, and this video is going to summarize some key considerations for the stock and our bull case, base case, and bear case. So after taking a look at the start stock chart initially, um, diving in and doing some analysis, now we're really going to conclude and wrap it up and uh, look at some of the key issues to think about and look at a few scenarios. So let's jump right into it. So here are some key considerations. So when you think about strengths, you know, Enbridge has a business model that has contracted revenue. So not the same, you know, it's related to oil and gas, but definitely not the same degree of cyclicality uh, that an oil and gas producer or an energy services firm would have. It's got long life assets with with tolling type revenue and contracted revenue. And so really, you know, when things got bad in the oil patch a few years ago, you know, where Enbridge could potentially get into trouble is counterparty risk. So if the oil and gas producers that are on the other side of these contracts uh, uh, go under, then ultimately, you know, Enbridge these take or pay contracts wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be fulfilled but for the most part they've got a really strong business model really stable and if we move into our second key strength we've got Roy's rising oil and gas demand you know and we'll jump over to the risks in a second around potentially re reduction in oil and gas demand over time but right now global oil and gas demand continues to rise and of course, there's a question of supply demand imbalance and that will have prices fluctuate over time. But, you know, in the current environment, oil and gas demand continues to rise. And there's obviously a, a definite need to try and uh, transport that oil and gas, particularly uh, in Canada and U.S. where Enbridge operates. Um, a lot of crude is being transported by rail right now because there just simply is not enough pipeline capacity. And another key strength is, you know, Enbridge has a strong dividend growth track record uh, going back many, many years, and it's in double digits per year. So I think if you've had, held Enbridge for the last 10, 15, 20 years, every year you're getting on average a 10 plus percent dividend increase, and that's driven huge shareholder value over time. Now if we look at some of the risks, as we talked about just a little bit earlier, reduction in oil and gas demand over time, particularly high cost oil sands crude. And so, you know, some of Enbridge pipelines have really benefited by the increase in oil sands activity in recent years. If oil and gas demand reduced, and we're talking, this is very long term risk here. But if you're a believer in electric vehicles, if you're a believer in uh, the world moving more and more towards renewable energy, which which I think will be the case, it's just a question of of how quickly and and to what degree um, this happens. But this is a risk in in the long term and. Just recognizing particularly some of Enbridge's assets are lined up with some higher cost um, oil production jurisdictions that uh, if this were to happen, this could dampen demand. So in our analysis piece, we talked about Enbridge's main line having record volumes and throughput. You know, if this were to come to pass, um, you could potentially see uh, some of Enbridge's pipelines operating nowhere close to capacity, and that would be a drain on results. Leverage, of course, 60 billion plus in debt on the balance sheet. And that has investors concerned, particularly given the growth pipeline of projects that they that they have on the go as well. So it's not just they've got $60 billion of debt after the Spectra acquisition, and now we're gonna be gushing free cash flow and paying that down aggressively over time. It's we're trying to bring leverage in line and at the same time fund the biggest growth uh, pipeline of growth projects um, in the company's history. And we're trying to do all that um, while uh, 
growing the dividend. And so it's a tricky balance for Enbridge. Uh, another risk is additional pipeline capacity. It's, it's very difficult in the current environment to get pipelines approved and built, but they're not the only game in town. Uh, we know the Trans Mountain's trying to build a pipeline. We've got Keystone XL, which is another major pipeline that, you know, depending on who gets their pipelines approved and built, you know, can and will have an impact on how each of these individual stocks perform. So if you think about Enbridge, if they're somehow able to get their pipeline approved and their uh, competitors' pipelines are not, well, that would be the most favorable outcome for Enbridge. In a case where all, all three of these pipelines get built, okay, uh, net even, assuming there's enough, enough crude uh, demand to be shipped. And so you can just think through some of the scenarios, but um, you know, a risk would be that Enbridge is unable to get their growth pipelines built uh, while their competitors do find a way. And lastly, capital expenditures and interest rates. You know, as, as interest rates are beginning to rise here, when you've got not only a $60 billion of debt on the, on the balance sheet, but you're also a high dividend stock, which typically in a rising interest rate environment um, can come under pressure. Uh, as investors might rotate out and back into bonds. So just something to keep in mind for Enbridge stock. And so if we look at both of those and we think about key drivers for the stock, you know, in Enbridge, there's actually quite a few short-term drivers. Um, simpli simplification of the story is a key one. Uh, the MLP roll-up, I think, would go a long way to just making it a lot more manageable for investors to piece together the story, the results, um, and and the cash flow. Another key driver is getting Line 3 built on time and on budget. They've got the key approval from the state of Minnesota now. Um, can they execute, get this thing built and up and running on time and on budget to drive their free cash flow projections? Third one is is clear and evident and probably something investors are, are concerned about is the balancing act. And we've talked about it a few times, but how do you reduce leverage? How do you bring leverage in line and keep the credit rating agencies happy while funding a massive pipeline of growth projects all at the same time avoiding further equity issuance and growing your dividend? So. It's a really tricky balancing act. You can see Enbridge pulling on as many levers as they have, including asset sales. And so, you know, I think most recently um, when they sold gas assets to Brookfield Infrastructure, I believe the market felt that they, they obtained a, um, a pretty attractive price on that, on that asset sale. And so depending on that you know the dollars that they're able to obtain from asset sales but also the valuation that they receive because they're going to lose that EBITDA or cash flow contribution from those assets over time but if they're able to sell those assets at a premium fund their growth project uh, projects simplify operations reduce leverage kind of essentially just execute and take away a lot of the noise and then some of the key drivers that are always going to be there for the stock oil and gas demand uh, and interest rates in this case. Uh, so those are the key considerations. And why don't we just jump in and look at some illustrative scenarios for the stock. So again, mini disclaimer, uh, this is by no means exhaustive. There are so many uh, things to look at here, but I always just find it interesting to just take a look at, you know, three scenarios. What could happen if everything's going well what ultimately, what sort of share price could we be driving towards in a base case? You know, what does that look like? And then if, if things don't go well, what's sort of our downside? So let's start with the bull case here. This is sort of if everything starts to go the way management uh, would want and execution. So we start out with our bull case. Line three is built on time, on budget. And we've got a successful MLP roll-up based on the current offer, which is essentially no premium. So uh, again, uh, and I believe as management guided to, no impact to free cash flow per share for Enbridge. Uh, so if they're able to complete that successfully without having to sweeten the offer, that would obviously be huge. Um, 
and they're able to fund their growth without dilution, delever the balance sheet, bring it, bring it in underneath five times debt to EBITDA, and maintain this dividend growth of 10% plus per year. I think if they're able to hit on all three of those things, you could see the company revert to historical valuations, maybe adjusted slightly because we're in a higher interest rate environment. So, you know, currently they're trading at about a 9% free cash flow yield. Maybe they move down into a 7% free cash flow per share yield. I think historically they're in that 6 to 7% range. Um, and if we think about a 2019 estimate of $4.75 per share, again, thinking about line three being built on time, on budget. Um, if you look at something like that, you're going to get to a share price of around $68. And, and that compares to about $46 today. So if we just pull the calculator out and do the math. Come on, calculator. 68 divided by 46. So that's 48% upside. So 48% upside in the bull case. In the base case, let's just presume that line three does get built, but there are some delays and cost overruns. Um, so you might see your 20 your 2019 free cash flow per share might uh, might not hit that 475 mark. Successful MLP roll up, but a premium has to be paid to the current offer, so they have to sweeten the pot again. That would have the effect down here of diluting your um, free cash flow per share. And these are illustrative numbers. I, I didn't model out um, in great detail. It's just illustrating how these numbers could move. And they're able to fund the growth without dilution. They're able to delever the balance sheet, but the dividend growth is flat in the near term. So um, they end up sort of holding off on growing the dividend, at least not at that 10% range in the near term, maybe for the next couple of years while they chew through these big growth projects and then resume it going forward. So you know, in that case, you probably wouldn't expect the valuation to go back to its historical premium levels so maybe it doesn't go down to seven percent free cash flow year yield but it probably comes in from the current nine percent range and so assuming an eight percent free cash flow yield and a 2019 estimated free cash flow of four dollars and 25 cents that gets you to implied share price of 53. so 53 dollars again divided by 46 that's 15 percent um 15% appreciation from current levels, plus you're clipping about a 6%, close to a 6% dividend yield. So your base case could you know, run you about a 20% return, assuming everything lines up here um, over, the next, over the next year. Lastly, bear case. So you know, if things aren't going according to plan, uh, significant line three delays, you know, Ultimately, a, a true bear case is it, it, it doesn't, doesn't ultimately happen, uh, but let's just assume it's significant line three delays. Um, unsuccessful in the MLP roll-up, that I would find hard to believe. Um, I think they're going to get it done. It's really a question of, is there added dilution necessary? So is there free cash flow per share number at Enbridge going to take a hit in the short term just to get that deal done? Um, so I'd, I'd put this, this one as unlikely. And uh, a credit rating downgrade, so assuming they can't get their ba balance sheet in order. Again, you know, time will tell, but I think Enbridge has, has done a lot of work between at the beginning of the year and now. With the $7 billion plus in asset sales, uh, they've started to take a pretty big bite out of that risk. And um, but let's assume that uh, they did need, uh, you know, the, the credit rating was downgraded. They did need to issue equity, and and of, and of course, in a scenario like this, we, you would not expect any dividend growth. Then you might even see a trade off from current levels. You know, a 10% free cash flow yield for a pipeline operator in the current interest rate environment would seem fairly attractive. Um, but if operationally they're not hitting on any of these items, 
um, and they're diluting shareholders and the credit rating is being downgraded and there's no dividend growth, you can obviously see a scenario where investors just become disinterested in the stock. And and maybe it's a 10% free cash flow yield on the 2019 estimates of $4 a share, which again would be would be a step back um, from what they're guiding to in 2018 at $4.30. So you'd see, you'd essentially have a company that um, that in 2017, um, free cash flow per share declined. In 2018, it rebounded. And then in 2019, it declined again. So you'd have a little bit of a, uh, a, a muddied growth, um, growth trajectory. And that, of course, would imply, um, I don't even need my calculator for this one, uh, $4 of free cash flow per share, 10% yield, would imply a share price of about $40. Um, so at a current share price of $46, that's actually not significant downside, plus you're clipping a 6% coupon. So I think for value investors, that's probably what's got some value investors interested in the story here. It's one of the reasons why I wanted to research this name and go through it in detail is just to see, I mean, of course, in, in any bear scenario, it can get a lot worse than what we've presented here. Um, and you could definitely see the, you know, in a, in a bear case that's significantly worse than what we've presented, of course, all bets are off. But, you know, thinking through it, um, the bear case, there's pretty decent downside protection here based on current valuations. And I think that a lot of the noise is already baked into the stock price. So uh, those are the three scenarios. In the bull case, could get close to $70 a share. Base case, a little bit above 50, uh, about a 15% appreciation from where it is today. And in the bear case, downside of about $6 a share down to 40. Uh, so that's it. You know, Let me know what you think. Which scenario do you think is the most likely have I missed anything or do you have a different take? Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed the segment on Enbridge. If you liked the video, please hit the thumbs up, subscribe to Ostrich Investing and check us out at our website or on Twitter. Until next time, happy investing and please don't bury your head in the sand. <laughs>